Hey guys, it's Daniel. The following is from Adam Casper, the person who produced Nirvana's final studio session in January of 1994. The recording sessions, which included You Know You're Right, took place at Robert Lang Studios. Later in this video, I'm going to show you a clip from my interview with Robert Lang where he discusses the making of You Know You're Right. But first, here's what Adam Casper had to say. Quote, The session at Robert Lang Studios, their last ever session, got You Know You're Right. I remember Grohl set up a drum set in the studio and played drums for eight hours a day while we mixed it. Non-stop. Kurt was not really around for most of the day, but would wake up in the evening, come in, and throw down a vocal harmony or lay down a line or two. We spent about three days a song, really slow paced. In the end, I think that people were just burnt out as far as remixing the whole thing. They left it the way it was. Same kind of scenario as the in utero mixing session. Kurt coming here and there, but when he did show up, it was pretty solid. He knocked it out pretty quick. Just to get him to do that much at that point seemed like, basically, Chris would pick him up and drive him to the studio, which was fairly close. He worked with me and nobody else, as far as it being just us in the room. It was a tenuous time as far as saying, let's do demos for 18 songs and go in and record them. It was more like, let's just get him in the studio and see what we can get. I think the idea was, he took some tapes and listened to stuff that Dave and Chris had written. He was opening up to maybe putting vocals on some of the songs that ended up being on that first Foo Fighters record. Dave knocked out a batch of those while we were there. I think to present to Kurt as a possibility for the Nirvana thing. I remember saying to Dave, dude, you should do a solo record someday. Some of the songs might have worked with Kurt. I'm not sure what he actually heard. That was making the band really happy. They wanted to have some input songwriting wise too. Or more input, I should say. I think he had You Know You're Right Ready, which he had been working on for a while. He played it before in concert. We did a lot of vocal tracks, punching in, doubling up stuff. We spent a good half day just doing vocals. A couple of takes and there it is, Nirvana, end quote. Now here's a clip from my interview with Robert Lang. If you want to see the full interview, the link is available below. The last song Nirvana recorded was with you and Adam. It was You Know You're Right. Were you in the studio when they were recording the song? And if so, what well, were your thoughts I, on it? The whole time I was here, uh, assistant Adam Casper, I just, you know, I remember the steel drums they were using in the intro of the song. I remember it at the end of the song. I remember that the timing had to be right. I remember Kirk coming in and and on that Sunday uh, when he got here, he, he was doing some vocals and then his back was hurting. And so, you know, he brought that, you know, that that fur, brown, light brown coat that he wore that, that yeah. was draped over the island down there. I went, wow, man. It was like, wow, you know, can I touch it? You know, whatever, you know. Uh, but he would come out in the studio and lay on the hard granite marble floor. And he, he was, his back was in some pain. And so, um, you know, that may have had something to do with, with some of the lyrics. I, you know, they, they were, um, they were writing, you know, uh, they had, uh, done some tracking with him and Chris before, of course, uh, Kurt showed up and, um, you know, it, it was, uh, like I say, he was, he came in first, he tried doing some vocals. They, they used an SM58 and they, they did something to where they hooked up the speakers by his head backwards, like out of phase. And so it gave, it canceled each other out. So it gave this whole new kind of thing to where he really, um, they were trying different things, different tricks and stuff that Adam had. And, uh, it, it was really cool. But, um, then we went up and had some pizza and I heard the <laughs> story, you know, and then it came back and, and the whole session, you know, we worked probably till up to, uh, midnight, one in the morning, something like that. But, uh, uh, what an experience, um, you know, this, you know, place definitely went down in history. And, and that, it was that that led into Dave Grohl coming back and doing that, uh, you know, the first Foo Fighter record with the ray gun on it. And, uh, yeah, yeah that, that was pretty damn cool. I think he had Greg Dooley of the, of the Afghan Wigs come in and do some guitar solo on that. But other than that, Dave crunched out like, uh, 17 songs in five days. Uh, I've never seen anything like it. You know, yeah. he played everything. I know you have a long relationship with Dave Grohl. Did it start with the You Know You're Right session? Yeah, it did. Yeah. And how was that experience for you, that session? I'm, from what I know, it was three days, correct? Yeah, three days. Uh, the 28th of January, 1994, 29th and 30th. And uh, Kurt showed up on that Sunday. 
Uh, he should have been on Saturday, but uh, uh, they didn't know Chris and uh, um, Dave did not know whether he's going to show up or not. And until three o'clock on Sunday afternoon, the 30th of January, um, they got the phone call and uh, Chris hightailed it out of here and went to go down to Madison Park and picked him up, and brought him out. And I'll never forget that because... We went out and had pizza up the street here, and Kurt started talking about... He had a, a big concert where Eddie Van Halen showed up backstage and was a drunk fool. So Kurt had him, basically, the security get him out. And so I heard that story firsthand with Kurt. You know, hearing it coming from, from Kurt was like a... That really stuck in my head, you know what I mean? That really... So it was like one of those things. Now, if I may ask, was that the first time you met Kurt the during the sessions? Yep. Yep. Uh huh. Yeah. That was that was the first time. So the two days where it was just Dave and Chris, was the vibe different than when it was Dave, Chris, and Kurt the last day? Not really. Not really. It was outside, maybe a little more serious, you know, on Sunday because I think they were like uh, maybe possibly surprised that Kurt got a hold of them on that Sunday at three o'clock in the afternoon. Um, they really. It, it seemed to me that. Uh, um, that you know, they they had a direct a direct line between, of course, Chris and and Dave. They kind of knew what they were doing, of course. You know, the professional people that they are, and they they almost like there's this mystical roadmap that they had. And I, you know, they don't they weren't writing music out. You know, they were just going out their feelings. You know, at least I didn't see any written. They were writing stuff down. Maybe a note or so in the background. You know what the song's name was, something like that. But they were pretty, uh, um, they were pretty incredible. Uh, just uh, those, those two days before Kurt came. I, I mean, they just, you know, I mean, you know, I think they, what, got about three, four, four tracks down. Yeah. Yeah. They got a bunch of stuff, like instrumental stuff down. Yeah. 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 So that, it was, like I say, it was, it was unbelievable to see them doing that. You know, Dave Grohl lived up the street. Um, his wife, Jennifer, worked at the QFC up here. So that's basically what brought Dave in the neighborhood. And so he had a house right up, um, not that far away, up in the edge of Ennis Harden. So, you know, that's uh, that was pretty cool. And uh, Dave used to come down here with his go-karts. Uh, uh, him and Jennifer would come down in go-karts and then... Uh, they would leave one here and Adam and Casper and I would be driving the go-karts around the block, around the neighborhood. And, you know, I, I think everybody knows who Adam Casper is, I would think. And uh, he's been famous for producing Pearl Jam, Soundgarden, uh, Queens of Stone Age, you know, the list goes on. Uh, I miss him dearly. And uh, he had moved up to Friday Harbor and I think he's somewhere up in Issaquah somewhere. But anyhow, cool guy. Really, really cool dude. So, you know, Jack and Dino's been here. He's been, I mean, just a, an incredible person. He's been really like, he's the godfather of grunge. Uh, yeah. John Plum, these guys that you've interviewed, London Bridge, all those guys over there, they're my great friends. And uh, uh, John's brought some sessions over here. And Jeff Ott used to work with me um, uh, here. Uh, Eric's an awesome dude, uh, really in the musical scene, which is good. And that's something that I never, ever got into, such as like uh, what Rick Parashar was doing at Lennon Bridge, doing, you know, Three Doors Down, Nickelback. Um, he did the first uh, Pearl Jam record, I think it was 10. Uh, but, you know, I mean, yeah. that's something that I didn't have time to, because I'm not really super musical. Uh, I'm just more a visionary and uh, a guy that likes to pick up a hammer and put a, put a, a belt, you know, Carpenter belt on and, and work. Yeah. Well, one of the things that, that that over the years doing these interviews that I actually have gained a lot of respect for the scene is that, um, as you mentioned, you guys all know each other. You're all friends, and like there really is this sense of community which I admire, and I think it's really cool that you guys all have each other's backs like that. You know what I mean? Exactly. Exactly. It's so cool because everybody, you know, everybody wants everybody to succeed, and and it is a tight community, Daniel. You're right, very much. When did you eventually hear the completed version of You Know You're Right? It wasn't until after Courtney decided to let them release it. I was starting to wonder, like, you know, what's going to happen to this? I just wanted to make sure that, you know, I had some type of credit on that record. And so I was <laughs> I was just like, you know, I, if you don't stay uh, proactive with the record companies 
And, you know, like, like I was doing the desire, dreams on or something like that with her heart, desire. And it's like, if you don't stay proactive, a couple of years go on, you don't get any credit. They just forget about you. You know what I mean? Like, like what I did with, with the heart situation. The only thing I got credit on that was like King Sunny a Day, the talking drums came in for a song called Voodoo they did here. But, uh, you know, getting, getting on back on the, uh, the, the phone call when I put down to, I think, John Silva's management, making sure that I had credits on, on You Know You're Right. Um, you know, they said, oh, Robert, don't worry. <laughs> don't worry about the credits. We're, you're going to be surprised. And so, you know, I, I waited. And then, of course, the box set, when we got the box set, you know, they sent it up to me. You open it up and pulled it out. And there's our house that's on the inside cover of it. So that was very, 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 very cool. Very cool.